welcome to Slavery and Its Legacies, a podcast of the Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition. Slavery and Its Legacies interviews visiting scholars, activists, and others about their contributions to the understanding of slavery, past and present, and its ongoing role in the development of the modern world. Hello, welcome. I'm David Blight. I'm the director of the Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition. And this is another in our series of what we've called the COVID-19 Conversations. And uh, today I'm thrilled to be uh, talking with my new colleague, um, Elizabeth Hinton, uh, who joins us here at Yale this summer, 2000, or 20, 2020. Um, Elizabeth, uh, uh, did her BA at NYU and her PhD at Columbia. Uh, she has, she taught for six years at Harvard University and I'm more than happy to say she's now moved here to Yale. Uh, she will be uh, in an appointment both in the history department, the law school, and I believe also the FM department. Uh, she's gonna be uh, way too overoccupied. But anyway, today we're going to talk about her terrific book, which has been out now four or five years, uh, but has become yet again ever so important in the recent crisis, uh, at least since the killing of George Floyd and others. Um, the book, of course, is the war, From the War on Poverty to the War on Crime, The Making of Mass Incarceration in America. Uh, Elizabeth, welcome. Thank you so much for having me, David. It's great to be here. You bet. Uh, okay, so uh, I want to dive right into this. Yeah, and I guess the first thing I want to hear you talk about is, you know, <laughs> every day on the news, every day in the press, in all of our sources, I'm wondering if it feels like your book is being read back to you at times, mm -hmm. because so much of the conversation about policing is, is, is people talking about, and of course, they don't know everything that historians know. That's why they need us, I guess. But uh, everyone's talking about how did we get here? Uh, how did this happen to policing? Uh, <laughs> how did cities become places where crime is fought rather than society is rehabilitated and so on? Um, what does this feel like right now in terms of yeah. that kind of, you know, the, the the imprint of your book has been strong and powerful, but right now it must sound like uh, a lot of people are talking about it who haven't read it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it feels, you know, obviously we're in a distinct historical moment now. I'm not, I don't believe that history repeats itself. I believe that there are some, there are patterns, right? And, you know, I think that the, the, my book kind of opens with a similar moment that we're now in, which is, of course, a period of sustained urban unrest and many tensions between police and low-income communities of color that are really rooted in fundamental socioeconomic inequalities. And I think um, my book really shows how, you know, there was a decision at the very, very highest levels of government to respond to that inequality through policing and through incarceration and absent the kind of major, that second reconstruction, you know, a socioeconomic second reconstruction. Um, during the 1960s, we are back in this space. And, you know, to be honest, these, um, the uprisings, these protests against police brutality, these protests against racial discrimination have been happening, have been a perennial occurrence for the past half century, but now, um, I think they've galvanized in a different way and we're beginning to have these really kind of interesting public conversations about systemic racism that weren't, you know, I mean, obviously racial discrimination and prejudice were being talked about in the 60s, but I feel like there's a new understanding of um, that, that's brought us away from the kind of pathological assumptions about black behavior that underlied so much of policies in the 1960s to really talk about, um, you know, how have Black people been structurally excluded from U.S. institutions um, historically, and what can white people, you know, like, 
where, how can we now reallocate resources and reckon with our history in ways to begin to actually combat that in a meaningful way? So I think that's one of the things that's really new. But yeah. so many of the conditions are the same and in some places have been exacerbated. Because of fact, our if I could take you right back to 1965, yeah. which isn't precisely where your book end, begins, but it, it's, it's a big moment. Mm -hmm. And you have that, you tell that story of this meeting, this big community meeting going on in Watts, mm -hmm. LA, uh, about these issues, these problems, police community relations, et cetera, et cetera. Five days later, the Watts uprising breaks out, mm -hmm. goes on for days. One of the biggest, most violent, destructive such thing in American history. Uh, talk about that a little bit, because that is the moment mm -hmm. which, uh, well, it's already happening mm -hmm. in the federal government, this process of, of uh, converting from, you know, the vision, the idealism of the great society to criminalization of urban places and so on. But what happened there in L.A.? Because that's, that's what's ultimately, it seems, on everybody's mind. Right. They're passing all these laws in 65, 66. Right, so let me, let, let me back up a little bit too, because I think um, you know, one of the big questions of US history from the perspective of white elites has been this constant fear, like what are we gonna do with free black people? Yeah. That's, you know, yeah. That is a question, right? So going back to 61, you know, as the demographics of American cities really began to change as a result of the great migration and Policymakers and social scientists started to become aware that in U.S. cities, and especially in cities where Black people were a third or edgy majority, like Detroit and D.C., where they were in the majority, in Cleveland, that growing populations of Black youth posed what policymakers and social scientists during the Kennedy administration began to call social dynamite. And they said, if we don't, and this is Kennedy saying, we need to kind of fulfill the promises of Reconstruction, we need to launch an intervention in these communities because if we don't these unemployment these poverty problems are going to get so bad that these social dynamite that these black youth are going to explode so you know in the early 60s policymakers had predicted that these uprisings would occur and so initially kennedy not launches this anti-delinquency program and then johnson expands it as the war on poverty so in many ways the the kind of seeds of these 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 interventions were to prevent future unrest. 1964, um, Harlem explodes after a 15 year old uh, kid is killed by the New York City police. And then in anticipation of future unrest in the summer of 1965, Johnson calls the war on crime. So this meeting, so this is one year, so the war on poverty only kind of existed autonomously for one year before it was quickly joined and conjoined with the war on crime. And of course, you know, the demands that were coming from black communities north and south by that period in the 60s, by that meeting in Watts, were not just about um, Civil Rights and Voting Rights Act. Of course, uh, Civil Rights and, and Voting Rights. Um, yeah. You know, the week after Johnson declares the war on crime, he sends the, the Voting Rights Act to Congress. And that really completes the federal government's civil rights package. It's not about it doesn't provide tools for major socioeconomic inclusion. And that had so, been the response to the movement in the South. Right, the right, right, no. right. And so in places like Los Angeles, right. where black people ostensibly had the right to vote, um, but we're still living in poverty, we're still attending segregated schools, we're still being overly policed, the residents of Watts uh, had many other demands. And at the same time too, you know, the mainstream civil rights movement was moving towards this, this new kind of socioeconomic yeah. um, package yeah. that, okay, we had, we have achieved these kind of basic citizenship rights. Now we need full um, political and economic inclusion. And it's that was where- the year the king goes to Chicago, right? Right, right. And that's where the federal government fell short. And instead the, the kind of structural intervention that, that targets those communities arise in the form of, um, of initially mainly policing programs. Right, right. yeah. Um, talk a bit, if you would, too, about the obsession here uh, early on, but especially by the late 60s, early 70s, with statistics. Mm -hmm. this, this, these, mm -hmm. I, didn't, I never understood that until mm -hmm. I read you and Khalil Muhammad, but, <laughs> but 
suddenly crime became this thing you could count or they thought they could and they had computers these were these would have been early computers apparently mm -hmm. but they started to collect all the statistical data and i find it fascinating it's, it's it's a deep part of your book mm -hmm. about statistical regimes themselves became part of this belief the criminal behavior was something black people were almost by nature going to do. Right, right, exactly. The statistical discourse, as Quinn Muhammad said, is what has sustained the whole thing. So, um, and you know, we, we do have to go back to that kind of post-emancipation moment to understand yeah. the, the kind of seeds of this. And this is Khalil's work, where basically, and we know, you know, even during the antebellum period, free blacks in the North were disproportionately arrested. Certainly after slavery ended, um, free black people were targeted by penal regimes and were disproportionately represented in the, the criminal justice system. So in, you know, in the first kind of censuses after emancipation, the black incarceration rate was, uh, was much higher than their proportion of the population. And progressives and, and uh, reformers and policymakers basically use, use these uh, incarceration statistics as a way to say, okay, you know, this population, black people are, are latently inherently criminal. And so this creates what Khalil Muhammad calls a statistical discourse about black crime that becomes a way to talk about race um, without evoking race ex explicitly and then further kind of rationalizes the targeted patrol, arrest, and incarceration of um, of black people who are seen as inherently criminal. So this these statistics begin to link kind of blackness and criminality. In the period that I'm talking about, um, especially as you mentioned, in this moment when these uh, there's a whole new kind of modernization of different forms of computer-based knowledge production, right. statistics becomes even more crucial to justifying and storing up support for the war on crime. So one of the big, um, the big misconceptions I think that new historical work on the carceral state has really corrected is that you know the narrative among sociologists and political scientists was that okay, well, you know, policymakers launched the war on crime in the '60s in response to violent crime rates. Violent crime was at an all-time high in the '60s, and actually, that's not um, so much true. Uh, violent crime in the 1960s was lower than it was during pro prohibition, lower than it was in the early 20th century. So that no either, right? It's not right. No either. The crime rates have been going down. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, what was new again, what were these and the, the kind of the sense that America was on the brink of chaos or on the brink of criminality were, of course, the urban uprisings that occurred during every summer of Johnson's presidency and were labeled by Johnson um, and others as, as, as criminal instead of, again, going back to the earlier point, thinking about, well, what are the kind of sets of political demands and the conditions that are the underlying causes of this unrest? Um, the statistical apparatus that was uh, created as part of the war on crime, right? Because you know, hundreds of, of mil hundreds of mil millions of dollars is all of a sudden going to um, the kind of measurement of crime. It's focused on street crime, and importantly, arrest rates are what kind of fuel the, na the the national crime rate or crime rate in a specific city. So if you deploy a set of police officers into um, Harlem right, to prevent future unrest, and um, they arrest 20 kids for, I don't know, um, malicious mischief, let's say. Even if that doesn't lead to a conviction, those arrests um, shape the crime rate. And in turn, those crime rates fuel the further infusion of law enforcement resources into these communities. The, the war on crime and the way that the federal grant structure worked effectively incentivized police departments to, um, to have to inflate their crime rate, no, their crime numbers in order to get additional law enforcement resources. The last thing I'll say about that too is that even the way that we measure crime is so classed because of course the crime rate doesn't at all take into account white collar crime. Right. Um, that, that low income people don't have access to, to make. So again, like when we're even, when we're talking about crime itself, it is a, it is a class and also a racialized measure. You know, and, and in your book, particularly for an old LBJ fan like me, uh, it, 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 it's, it's rough at first to realize, I mean, obviously it's true, 
this, and as you say it, you show it, you, you are absolutely persuasive. The war on crime was bipartisan, no question. And there are differences between what the LBJ people do and what the Nixon people do and so on. And then the Reagan people later, right? But we always say, you know, you can look this up in any textbook. The tragedy of LBJ was that the war in Vietnam crushed his great society project. Well, true. But the Great Society Project and all of that idealism and all those programs is also, in effect, kind of engaged in its own tragedy, its own yeah. self-destruction from within by this war on crime. Yep. That, that, to me, is one of the big insights of your book. It really, sh And then you get all this legislation. Right. Uh, the, um, uh, the Housing Act, the Voting mm -hmm. Rights Act, the Law Enforcement Act all come out but then that's in 65 but then by 68 you well you first you get the safe streets act and then you mm -hmm. get that what is it called omnibus crime mm -hmm. bipartisan right yep uh this is this big crime bill by 68 after all the urban uprisings now which have gone on for four years mm -hmm. and you know and then of course king's assassination and all the rest um well before Vietnam was taking LBJ down, there's a sense in which this domestic crisis was taking him down as well. And then Nixon just picks it up, doesn't he? And, yep. was, and was much better at it. Yep. I mean, you know, the law and order president, right? Yep. That, that exactly. This guy now has appropriated. So. Anyway, talk about that. Yeah, a bit. yeah. so it's, so, it's so a you, lot of different threads that are going on here. <laughs> times some of us lived through but didn't know it. <laughs> yeah, I, well, you, I mean, you just said that really beautifully, and I, you know, I also struggled with, um, with kind of grappling with LBJ and 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 this policy yeah. path. And I didn't when I began the. You like him on the day he signs that Voting Rights Act. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I feel, you know, I frankly. I have a soft spot for LBJ and Nixon. Nixon was, I, I like to say, our last, you know, like real liberal president. Um, well, that's true. You know, far to the left of Obama. So, um, you know, they're both, both very, they're very interesting. When I started the research, you know, and of course the book came out of my dissertation work in graduate school, mm -hmm. um, I started with Nixon because yeah. I, you know, I thought that that's where the origins of this were. And I kept on having to go back, 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 all the way right. to Kennedy. Yeah. Um, it must have been Nixon. Yeah, oh. yeah. <laughs> well, but this is the thing, and I really had to, to it, it took me, probably the hardest thing to, to come to grips with was grappling with the intentionality question in the book. And I, and I really uh -huh. think that... Um, yeah. When is it that, intentional and when? Yeah, I mean, Johnson, you know, he, he did launch, I believe, that he saw the war on crime as really this way to improve... American society, just like the war on poverty and all of and all of his domestic social legislation, um, yeah. he, you know, this was something that was launched really in earnest, and it was limited by, by his own racism and his own blind spots um, to, you know, what a more kind of comprehensive um, policy path. Nixon, on the other hand, you know, so 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 as you said, Johnson kind of introduced these seeds of this. Uh, kind of punitive uh, dimension of social welfare programs in U.S. policy, and when Nixon took office, um, not with those good intentions, with 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 the sense that of um, you know black people are uh, inherently criminal, and the best thing that we can do is just round them up and take them off the streets. I mean, that was essentially the ethos of his administration. So, right. kind of took that that seed that that Johnson planted, and then expanded it, and um, which is how and, mass incarceration begins, right? Right, right. And 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 what, whereas Johnson, the Johnson administration was focused um, more on kind of urban police forces and 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 equipping police with riot control uh, gear. Um, the Nixon administration, even though most of the federal dollars the war on crime were going to police departments, but the Nixon administration does begin a, a massive investment and a construction program in our prison system. Um, soon after he, he, he took office. So um, there's a, you know, Johnson is the architect um, right. of, of, I think, modern American criminal justice. I think Bill Clinton also um, plays an important role is kind of like the second architect of these great liberal presidents. But Nixon, um, I think, you know, really sets this, 
sets this tone where, you know, the only option, he, he, he puts the nation on this path where, and this is, I think, you know, in many senses, what's at the heart of the protest today and George Floyd, where, you know, social welfare programs aren't even a part of um, the services that are offered to low-income communities of color. So he, you know, continues to divest um, and retrench from the, uh, the, the equal opportunity programs of the war on poverty and the social welfare programs of the war on poverty. And so, you know, with, um, with mainly police and carceral programs operating in these communities, that proves to be a devastating um, path for low-income communities where these policies are being in energetically implemented. You know, on that point, I, I love to try to show how historians, well, how we do our work. And here, here's a, a little piece of your research that I found stunning. It's this guy who works for Nixon. He's in Nixon's uh, crime shop, so to speak. He's, from, he's in St. Louis. His name was Jeff Shepard. And this is when, when, when the Nixon group is creating all these, they're doing all these interviews with young black men probably teenagers in many cases, in various cities, and they're accumulating all this information, basically to try to build, a, it appears, a database about potential criminal behavior. Mm -hmm. And this guy gets worried. I, I'm just gonna read the quote. Let's, yeah, yeah. It, great. It's amazing, great it's amazing. Uh, this guy gets really worried, like, what are we doing here? He says, this is becoming one immense difficulty here in that the computer files do not consist of convictions or even records of arrests, but rather of opinions of police officers on individuals. Civil rights is not my bag, but this stuff scares me to death. And he goes on even longer. He says, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. You know, this is, this is all this data. It's just our opinions. Uh, and then he kind of just says in the end, oh, well, I guess that's what we're doing. But they did create this big database that then created these zones, right, where they mm -hmm. had to watch these people. Right. And these kids hadn't done anything yet. It was right. Interviewed. By, right. By line policemen. Mm -hmm. so you know, right. I, I never, you know, I never knew that anything like that went on. But that's amazing. <laughs> and and that you know that program again is the kind of the forerunner to CompStat and the and the predictive policing and hotspots policing programs that have really ravaged communities um, in the 80s and 90s and today and, and also fueled mass incarceration. It's, it's a, you know, it is, it is the kind of prime example of over-policing of low-income communities of color and at the same time under-protecting them. Um, you know, the, 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 the yeah. goal, you know, is not to necessarily um, keep citizens safe in, those, in, in, in these targeted communities, but to search for suspects and perhaps more importantly, potential suspects, because you know, by virtue of your skin color and your your residence, you are a potential criminal. Again, thinking Almost about like profiling yeah. before profiling. Right. Exactly. It's really, it's it's one form of profiling before a, a, a you know a more open kind of profiling. Yeah. Exactly. I found that exactly. amazing. And then and then in this process, like in the seventies, and then into the eighties. Uh, gangs began to grow more and more, right? Mm -hmm. uh, now that gets caught up in the in drugs too, and that's a later mm -hmm. part of your book. Yep. How the war on crime becomes a war on drugs. Yep. But gangs begin to evolve mm -hmm. for lots of reasons, God knows, but in part in response to being policed. Mm -hmm. right? right. Right. So this is the and and you know this is this is part of like the big question of. I think my work as a whole, but um, but future work too, trying to historicize um, gang violence. I think one of the questions is, or perhaps the big question is how, you know, initially in the 60s and 70s, as the war on crime was, um, and police and, and these kinds of programs that Jeff Shepard were talking about, these, these, uh, these programs attempting to round up potential criminals were being implemented in communities of color. Um, the response on the part of communities was further uprisings. You know, we, we think that um, that this era kind of ended in 68, but in many smaller communities, there were constant battles between residents and police and, and, um, and demonstrations in response to police brutality, in response to the kind of um, new policing of ordinary everyday activity. For example, police would, you know, show up to housing projects to, um, to break up a party or, 
or to arrest somebody and residents would, um, would start throwing rocks at police or start yelling at police and the situation would escalate, escalate from there. So one of, I think, the big questions is, you know, the, the kind of first forms of um, collective violence that emerge in these communities are uprisings, are protests, and then somehow in the mid-1970s, you know, as um, pr new prisons are being constructed and as police are kind of moving from uh, riot prevention task forces to gang task forces, um, that collective, that external collective violence turns internal in the form of, um, of, of gang warfare and, and kind of other forms of, of internal social harm um, that, you know, have, are, are become a, a part of the urban landscape. So in many ways, there's kind of like a three front war that ends up being fought um, in these over-policed and under-protected communities. Residents in a struggle against the police department and also residents in a struggle against um, one another. It's amazing how much the war metaphor is absolutely ubiquitous yeah. in this story, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Can I ask you about this, this idea of delinquency? Mm -hmm. I mean, you say it went right back to the Kennedy administration. It's probably it's older than that, no doubt. But, but the problem became finding and dealing with delinquency. A quick story here, and I'm, we can dispense with it, but it, it shows you how much older I am. But in 1971, I got out of college. I go back to Flint, Michigan, where I grew up. Uh, I didn't get offered a teaching job yet, but I got offered a job in a delinquency, uh, I forget exactly what it was called. It was a program run for delinquent boys. Wow. And in Flint. Yeah, in Flint. And it was, uh, and they offered me the job. I was gonna be, I had no idea what I was doing, but I was gonna be some kind of counselor advisor. And, you know, I was gonna, I, it may have, may have been as much a big brother thing it was anything else, but it, but it had delinquency in its title. It was funded by the city, I think, and 1971, you know, mm -hmm. and for, for kids who had screwed up in school mm -hmm. and couldn't be kept in the school. Mm -hmm. I turned that down when I got off to teaching job. <laughs> so I never did it. But these programs were out there, you know, yeah. they were products of that late 60s, early 70s moment. Mm -hmm. There were still these attempts, you know, at these kinds mm -hmm. of programs, probably funded by the city or mm -hmm. the school system. But wasn't that beginning to fade away by then? Yeah. It, well, so, like so yeah. By I mean, that, that's, that's really, that, that's really interesting. I mean, I think, um, you know, one, it, it could be part of a larger shift where a lot of the kind of educational resources and job training um, that at risk or, or potentially delinquent uh, yeah. needed were only available to, to youth who were um, vulnerable or who had come into contact with police officers. So um, yeah. they probably you know, had, they had police records. Right. Right, right. So, so again, like these social welfare services that in 61 and 64 were available to the entire community and, you know, thinking about, again, like a comprehensive um, crime control program and, and more expansive meetings of public safety increasingly become available to youth who had gotten into trouble. Yeah. Um, so that might be kind of one version of, and, and the other is that, you know, increasingly um, when we, the first kind of major piece of uh, federal juvenile justice um, policy appears in 1974. Mm -hmm. And um, that really kind of bifurcates the system and sets up a grant structure where um, the kind of like rehabilitation programs are, are more available to white youth in rural areas. And the, the kind of the the punitive programs and, and in, in the, the kind of public system of incarceration, um, those programs end up targeting youth of color. So I, I would bet in this moment, um, that might be part of that exact shift where social welfare have, programs yeah. are increasingly tied to uh, the growing crime control apparatus. Wow. I don't know. I've always, always wondered whatever happened to that program. <laughs> I, I, I can still remember the guy interviewing me saying like something like, and you're going to be their guy. And it probably scared the hell out of me. Yeah. But anyway, uh, okay, what about the transition here to the war on drugs, mm -hmm. which you know, comes a bit later, but becomes a huge part of this story, and then a huge part 
of the increasing rates of incarceration mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the 70s into the 80s mm -hmm. and even well beyond until now. Mm -hmm. uh, Talk a bit about that process. Well, one of the things that, um, that I think that we don't talk about, especially when we're talking about the 70s era war on drugs, is that the way that I view um, you know, Nixon's, de Nixon's decision to focus on drug use and drug trafficking was strategic in the sense that um, in the 1980s, I think you know, some of the, the questions about whether or not policymakers would treat drug abuse as a criminal issue rather than a public health issue ends up getting resolved. So um, Reagan, during the Reagan administration, federal policymakers criminalized drug abusers. And this decision, uh, you know, leads to re really kind of, um, you know, the path to mass incarceration, we were already on our way to that path. And by the mid 70s, prisons for the first time in US history had become majority people of color. But in the 1980s and 1990s, that's when we really, really see this prison population explosion due to new harsh penalties associated with nonviolent drug offenders, especially um, with regards to crack use, the use of uh, the crystallized form of powder cocaine, which um, is, you know, comes with at the federal level, much more severe, 100 times more severe penalties than um, powder cocaine. And the people who were more not, you know, most crack users were white, but the people who were more likely to be arrested for crack were black. And so this policy had an especially devastating impact in, um, in black communities. And now what's interesting is, uh, you know, we're, we're beginning to have these conversations in the context of the opioid ep epidemic. Um, as well, actually, drug, you know, this is really a public health issue and we need to decarcerate nonviolent drug offenders. Um, now that white people are, are you know, are, are more, have become more ensnared in the system. Whole communities you know, Right. Now it's a public health issue. And I think it should, you know, I, again, I think it should be. This also, you know, going back to what we talked about earlier, really reflects our national priorities and, yeah. and the decision yeah. to respond to drug abuse as something that's criminal rather than let's get you treatment, which is. Again, I mean, this is why these policies make no sense. Treatment is so much less costly than incarcerating somebody. Yeah, yeah. I also <laughs> loved your point in your book uh, about how this use of federal power against drugs is being done by these people who tout, the, tout, the, tout themselves every day as states' rights. Mm -hmm. you know, right. Well, that's a big contradiction to Nixon. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. the Republican Party ever since, to be frank. Um, Okay, so the incarceral state. Uh, now, what is it, 2.2 or more million people in 59, 60% of them black and Latino. Um, it, what is the carceral state to, when you have to do that for people who are new? What would, how is this, what is this thing we live mm -hmm. with now called the carceral state? Mm -hmm. And I'll get around to later how in the mm -hmm. world we solve it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's the big question. So, um, you know, one of the things why I like carceral state is mm -hmm. because I think that this, that this, as you said, really brings together the kind of the, the network of programs that, that foster um, surveillance and confinement in targeted communities. So it's not just about, um, you know, it, it's not, the, the carceral state is not just about the people who are in prison, but the, the, pe the web of people who are under various forms of criminal justice supervision and also under supervision by the state under social welfare programs like public assistance programs, which have become more carceral because the, of the ways in which they are tied to law enforcement, because of the ways in which um, people who, receive public assistance themselves are criminalized. So the carceral state for me refers to, um, in some ways, the institutions that are actively involved in criminalizing low-income communities. And it's not just about prisons, but about probation officers and about um, you know, public schools that are, that are over-policed and, and where students are arrested for things that they should not be, and, um, and welfare and public housing projects that um, you know, themselves have 
are, are, are fortified um, with metal detectors and, um, and gates and bars and things like this is all part of the carceral state. And, um, you know, many Americans, not all Americans live inside that state, even if they're not in prison. Right, indeed. And uh, now, contrary to a famous book, by Michelle Alexander, who says this is the new Jim Crow, mm -hmm. uh, you you subtly say no, it's not the new Jim Crow. It's something mm -hmm. else, mm -hmm. it's something even larger. What do you mean by that? So, um, you know, Jim Crow, of course, was a was a system of segregation that was based explicitly on race, and I think, yeah. you know, the mass incarceration and 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 um, even you know our policing strategies are not. Um, kind of enforced explicitly along racial lines, even though that we know that people of color are disproportionately affected. But, you know, there are important things about the, the kind of nature or the conditions that, um, that are more likely to bring people into this carceral state that weren't part of uh, the Jim Crow segregationist regimes in the South. For instance, you know, I think education levels are the greatest predictor of future incarceration than anything else than race. And I think this is so important. So if you're a black school, the issue. Right. <laughs> if you're a black man with a high school diploma, you are far less likely, far less likely to go to prison than if you're a white man without a high school diploma, right? These, these kinds of things weren't part of that Jim Crow regime. Where I think the new Jim Crow, that concept is really helpful um, is in terms of reentry because the 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 civic status of people after they are released from prison is very much like um, or resembles um, the civic status of Black people living under the Jim Crow regime. Um, you know, when you when you're released from prison, you you know you can't get a job. You don't in many states you don't have access to public ben benefits. In some states you can't vote. All of these things um, you know enforce a kind of second class status where you're not really part of the polity and that you know in many ways that those kind of legal mechanisms resemble you're structurally um, defined outside of yes the polity. And exactly I, new haven has had an issue with that over the years where where we now live you know the recidivism mm -hmm. people return right. from prison and yet what's here for them you know right kinds of jobs some cities exactly. have programs some cities don't um yeah, it, although although New Jim Crow is a very catchy term. Oh God, yes. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think I I, I love uh, the book. It was so. I mean, it's such an important book, and I think um, oh, yeah. I, I think the New Jim. I mean, I think that that what's so important about it is that that phrase captures the racial dimension uh, <laughs> that yeah. is that is so much of the logic of um, of mass incarceration that had I think. Um, at least in kind of public discussions, been ignored. So I mean, it, it, it was incredibly, it's incredibly, incredibly important. And I'm glad to see too that the book um, is is having just like a, a lot of books on these issues is having a real resurgence now. I'm all for it too. I just, I just love yeah. the distinctions, you know, that historians need sometimes to make. It's just, I mean, I'm I'm a big cheerleader right now for how our society needs historians. They're discovering it every yeah. day, you know. Uh, so, uh, what really happened? Oh, nice that you asked. Anyway, but don't uh, you feel like like there 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 has the historians have been in more demand at least oh, in, yeah. in part of these public conversations in recent weeks? I mean, that's oh god, yes, I yeah, mean, and actually for even longer. I mean, it depends on the yeah. issue, yeah, but for even longer. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, uh, when it comes to my field of slavery, the Civil War, and all that. Uh, there never were as many media requests for people in any part of my field as there were after the Charleston Massacre and mm -hmm, after the right. Charleston marches. And now <laughs> it's just you know, constant. Uh, that, that, that's, that's about the only good thing I can find out of going through these traumas. But speaking of these traumas, uh, before we leave this today, inevitably, let's talk a little bit more about the present. I don't know if you've had time to look at the House of Representatives bill, uh, the Policing and Justice Act. I happened to read it like the day after it came out because I had to do an interview and I thought I might get asked. I wasn't, but I might get asked. Anyway, there's a lot in it, you know, it's interesting. Although most of its features apparently 
uh, like demilitarizing police and uh, going after that uh, qualified immunity idea and many other elements of it were already there in Eric Holder and Barack Obama's uh, work uh, before this. I mean, mm -hmm. they kind of just used that stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't know what the odds are that's ever going to get passed uh, before the election. Probably not very good at all because of the Senate. But what kind of, uh, I don't know, confidence or where are you at on this? I mean, we're in a moment now that is, without question, truly extraordinary. Mm -hmm. uh, our society has to act. Our politics has to act. Mm -hmm. And every day and every way we are talking about this as never before. If you had a list of policy measures, really policy measures, and you do the kind of history that makes people think about policy, mm -hmm. uh, what, what would be on your list mm -hmm. to so, begin to solve these issues? Yeah, I mean, one of the things, again, um, it's, it's the pattern of how policymakers kind of always respond to these moments. And, yeah. There has been a sense, I mean, since the 60s, that somehow uh, police are going to train and yeah. hardware and equipment their way out of this. So, you know, right. um, back right. in the 60s, it was riot gear and it was police community relations training. Now it's more police community relations training and body cams. And, and do they have gear? They got yeah. gear coming they don't, need, they don't need more gear. They don't need body cams. Um, and, and, and I don't think they need more police community relations training. I think that there, there has to be, um, you know, I, I think the concept of divest invest is important. I think that we need to start investing in, um, you know, employment and education and housing at scale. We have not. Um, I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times, so, uh, like the week after George Floyd was killed, basically saying, let's go back to maximum feasible participation, which was the kind of early uh, principle that steered the war on poverty, where the federal government was funding autonomous grassroots organiza organizations directly. I think that we need to begin to do that and get money into communities. Um, so, you know- Find those best organizations that are right. doing great things already and fund them better. Exactly, exactly. So I think, you know, the first thing is maybe we shouldn't look at the police. Let's look at what are the other services that communities need and what kinds of services um, are, are police, uh, you know, responding to in communities that they, that they, don't, that they shouldn't be like, like drug abuse. Right. Um, you know, can we, can, can we have health professionals respond to those problems? Like marital, marital uh, disputes, can we, can we get therapists there instead of police officers who are responsible for doing all these things that aren't necessarily part of police work and that they're not trained for? So um, I guess I'd, I'd like to see us think about how we can have an expansive definition of public safety that, that, um, that kind of looks beyond um, you know, how we've thought of it traditionally and that thinks about how community, how we can empower communities, especially communities that have been um, disenfranchised and marginalized into keeping their own community safe on their own terms. Um, I'd like to see things that, you know, like a de-escalation of police in schools. Like why is it that, you know, we have these armed police officers walking around urban public schools, you know, let's, and this hasn't, and, and these, these strategies have all failed. I mean, I think that's one of the big takeaways of my book is that- A lot of the police um, don't want to be there, do they? Right. <laughs> and the police don't want to be social workers. I mean, you know, I've, you know I, I've, I've, I've heard police say almost every time I, I interact, you know, like we're supposed to do all these things that have nothing to do with us. Right. Um, so, you know, I, I think we, like this, this decision again to manage socioeconomic problems and racism with policing hasn't worked, but what did work consistently and what's much cheaper is things like tenant patrols mm. um, and, and, and investing in prevention programs. Again, treatment is cheaper than incarcerating somebody. And yet, and yet uh, these, these things never, these alternatives never got the kind of support necessary. And so, I, you know, it's baby steps, right? But I think we are at a moment when we need to be imaginative and we need to support policies that are gonna lead to real transformation. And the mandate, I mean, that's what's so exciting is that the mandate is there, is that now, oh, yeah. you know, most Americans agree with the protests. And, and I think that, you know, even conservatives are beginning to, 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 to think deeply about the ways in which 
racism is not about just individual pre prejudice, but the way that racism structures American society. And so as this awareness grows, it's time for big changes. Well, indeed. And, you know, for a moment, we might even try to be hopeful. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> we, we uh, should be. We should yeah, be. Because, you know, assuming we get a fundamental political change, uh, assuming we get a big change in the United States Senate, and assuming that this crisis, which is huge, I mean, you couple the, uh, the protests going on with the virus, with the economic collapse, and you have a reckoning like Reconstruction, mm -hmm. civil rights in the 60s, and then some. Mm -hmm. And a Biden administration, whatever it will look like, uh, can come in with with the mandate. That's the key word. Right. To right. really do something. Uh, mm -hmm. Call it a third civil rights movement. Call it whatever right. you want to call it. But by next summer at this time, you could begin to imagine, you know, a, an om a new omnibus bill. It's not a crime bill. Right. And, and it's and it's not just about policing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm a product of public schools public schools, public universities, without, a public, without public education, I don't have an education. It is still the answer mm -hmm. in so many ways. I mean, mm -hmm. it's also one of the hardest things to do, improving public schools where they don't have the tax base that suburbs do. Right, right. But it's, it's not an impossible revolution. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, it just right. is. And, uh, you know, it's priorities, it's imagination, and it's different kinds of policy revolutions. So who knows? You know, this is a moment that, uh, and it isn't, isn't it, the more you do history, at least for me, <laughs> the more I realize we can have all the theories we want about how change happens and this, this happens and that's supposed to happen. But it is, unfortunately, big events that mm -hmm. make us do things. Right often violent events, mm -hmm. you, you can't predict them. But here we are, you know, in one month, here we are talking about things that we just couldn't have talked about. Right. Wouldn't have, wouldn't have, uh, it would have been dreamy to talk about this new civil rights legislation. Um, now. Well, it's also amazing, I mean, just on that note, and I know that this is, you know, you're writing about this, but I mean, there's been for years debates about the Confederate monuments and in yeah. the past month, and now they're all going down. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> I just wrote in a piece uh, that, you know, frankly, no one who works on these matters, as I have all my life, ever believed that Robert E. Lee Monument in Richmond would go down. Right. It, it would get attacked. It would be, it's always been controversial since the day it was unveiled. But no one ever believed it would go down. They're all going down. Now. Yeah. That's why it's fascinating to try to understand, all right, now what are we going to do in its wake? Right. Right. That's the question. What kind of memorial landscape will this country try to imagine? And how mm -hmm. do we do that? You know? right. Uh, right. And we're going to have a hell of a fight over the, I mean, Charles Below in today's New York Times went after George Washington. He says, George Washington. Now, George Washington coming down is, I don't know quite what that means yet. But yeah. <laughs> although I did hear, uh, who was it who said, if D.C. gets statehood, they should rename the city Washington Douglas. No, I thought that was kind of, <laughs> never had a hyphenated state. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. It could still be DC. I mean, it's still gonna be DC, but uh, I don't know, we'll see. But the question uh, is, I mean, for me again- Everything's you know, up for grabs. You know? Yeah, I, I mean, I hope that, you know, what I worry about is that these monuments are going to come down, these renamings are going to happen, and then people are going to be like, okay, we solved it, now now it's over, yeah. we took all this stuff down, and, it, and it's, and, and so that's what I worry about. But that the structures, the, that yeah, needs, the structures you're writing, these are symbols after all. They matter, right. they count, they do. Right. People obviously care about them. Uh, I always say, you know, uh, <laughs> there are a lot of monuments around that no one gives a damn about. <laughs> When people do give a damn about a monument, they really do. <laughs> but yeah, still, there's the structures of society, the economic right. structures, the political right. structures. You can take down all the Confederate monuments you want, but until we can get rid of voter suppression, exactly, it may not matter. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Mm, exactly. Anyway, you know what? The next we're gonna have to do another interview. <laughs> I can coerce you to talk about that new book you're doing about California. I mean, I know I know something about your your next two projects.
projects, but I didn't think we could even fit it into this. So, uh, gosh, this was fascinating. There's was so fun. much more in this book. And anyone <laughs> out there that doesn't have it uh, yet, I strongly urge you to get Elizabeth's book, uh, From the War on Poverty to the War on Crime. Uh, we only touched upon the surfaces of it here. And if you're an LBJ lover, he'll, he'll get through it. Don't worry. <laughs> you're fine. Um, but it, it does, especially for people of my generation who kind of lived this, I mean, I was young, very young, kind of lived this story, but it tells you again and again and again, you can live some piece of history. That doesn't mean you really know what's happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's why we have historians like you. Um, anyway, Elizabeth, thank you for doing this. Let's, thank you so much, David. Let's uh, do another one of these on your future work at some point. Okay. Yeah, I'd love that. I love that. We will. Okay. Well, thanks for joining. Uh, yeah. And thank all of you for joining. This is another of our uh, COVID-19 conversations at the GLC. I'm David Blight, uh, the director and a professor of history at Yale. Thank you very much. As always, uh, the Gilder Lehrman Center welcomes contributions from those who support our work and our mission. To give, uh, please go to the link in the event invitation uh, visit the GLC web page and click on donate or email the Gilder Lehrman Center for more information. Uh, the Gilder Lehrman Center is uh, conducting uh, a widespread fundraising campaign to sustain all of the activities we do in the coming years and we welcome any help uh, you can give us. Thank you very much.